Today we have three guests, Professor Max from Carnegie Mellon University, Professor Littman from Brown University, and Mr. Bunsell from the University of Washington. So just a few things before we get started. There will be a Q&A session at the end of each presentation. So pl please feel free to either unmute your mic and say your question out loud or type it in the chat. If you would like your question to remain anonymous, please um, message either Pranav or I and we will ask the question on your behalf. And also, uh, this session will be recorded, and posted to YouTube. So if you'd like to view it later on, um, please check our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Thank you. All right, yeah. So the first talk is by Professor Max, an associate professor at Carnegie Mellon University, directing search-based planning laboratory. His group researches heuristic search, decision-making, and planning algorithms, all with applications to the control of robotic systems. His group has over 150 publications in top robotics uh, conferences and journals, and their work has been recognized by numerous awards. He also co-founded uh, Travel Wits and founded Robotics. Today, he will be speaking about high school math through the lens of robotics. All right. Thank you, uh, Pranav. Uh, can you guys hear me all right? I want to make sure that... Yes, okay. yes. Good. All right. So as I uh, uh, talk through this, uh, feel free to ask questions at any point of time. So, I mean, I, I don't particularly like uh, having this format when uh, all the questions at the end. So just stop and ask at any point of time. Uh, also, I want to make sure that this is, uh, gets acknowledged that this is a uh, work in a collaboration with the several folks, uh, um, John Butsky, Rachel Burson, uh, Tim Heffernan, and it's a collaboration between uh, um, uh, Robert Witz, uh, one, uh, my company, PBS, which is a TV station in Pennsylvania, and uh, PA Rural, uh, which is another company uh, in uh, Pennsylvania dedicated to, to bringing robotics to high school. So uh, the talk is about robotics. Uh, how many of uh, folks here uh, on the call uh, actually know of, uh, you know, have some sort of experience working with robotics? Uh, and I guess for the purpose of trying to figure that out, I will uh, ask you to perhaps uh, uh, raise your hand uh, in Zoom. You know, some sort of a, um, if you know what I mean, like that, that there is a possibility for you to raise the hand. Uh, in Zoom, anyone? Nope, nope, nope. Okay, a few people. All right. Um, okay, good. So um, um, th this is kind of actually nice because uh, um, what I will be talking about is uh, I will try to, um, within a single uh, uh, talk, give an overview of uh, how uh, um, uh, robotics, uh, typical robotic architecture is done and uh, some of the underlying math that goes into it. And hopefully at the end of the talk, uh, you will actually uh, come out with uh, uh, some uh, understanding of how robotics uh, typically being uh, developed. Um, so uh, just before I jump into this, a little bit of uh, about myself uh, and my group. Uh, so I'm a professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and uh, my specialty is in robotics. In particular, my group develops uh, uh, what's uh, referred to as a planning, decision-making, learning in robotic systems, which is all about uh, figuring out uh, uh, what the robot should do next, how to do it, uh, how to move its uh, arms, how to move, uh, um, uh, how to drive, uh, how to fly, and, and so on and so on. And kind of um, there is a cross uh, board in terms of the algorithms that, uh, so sorry, in terms of the robotic uh, systems that we work on. Um, we work on uh, ground, aerial, and manipulators and teams of robots. And uh, for me personally, it's much more about the uh, algorithms, uh, the underlying algorithms that uh, enable all those robots uh, to do, um, uh, to make those decisions. So uh, I'm very much uh, um, interested in developing the underlying algorithms uh, that enable them to do it. And then uh, my, my group uh, applies them to all kinds of different robotic systems. Uh, also, I'm very much interested uh, in having uh, the algorithms that come with a very rigorous theoretical guarantees. I am um, um, uh, kind of a, uh, one of the, those uh, folks who uh, think it's very important uh, in robotics uh, uh, to have not just the systems that work, but also have ability to analyze uh, um, what uh, guarantees uh, those uh, 
algorithms can provide uh, that allows you to uh, the ability to kind of a, uh, say uh, what they will be able to handle, what they can handle, and that ability to analyze is very important uh, uh, to understand complex systems. And of course, uh, I'm also uh, one of the requirements for all the people that work in my group is to make sure that the algorithms we develop are actually applicable to real world robotic systems. And from that perspective, uh, every single algorithm that my group develops, I would like to see it running on uh, uh, some robotic systems. So I'll show a few examples. Um, so on the, uh, um, this is uh, examples on the aerial um, manipulation uh, on the aerial systems. Uh, so this uh, uh, one of the robots that my uh, um, lab has built. That's a uh, aerial um, uh, robot. Uh, in particular, it's a quadrotor, so it has a, you know, four rotors. Uh, and uh, uh, it might be a little bit hard to see, but those are the plans that it generates that are being. Uh, um, uh, generated in response to the um, overall environment that it built uh, uh, using its own board sensor. So uh, it basically it carries a, a laser sensor, it carries a, um, the uh, uh, few other sensors uh, with which it can build a 3D uh, world of the environment and then uh, uh, it constantly has to replan uh, in this uh, environment uh, to generate a collision-free path. For it. Uh, the same type of uh, algorithms that uh, we run on this guy, we also run on a large helicopter, K-Max helicopter, which is a full-scale helicopter that, of course, uh, the helicopter itself was not built by my group, uh, but it rather, was, rather was built by Lockheed Martin, but it's uh, the same type of uh, planning algorithm. So, this is an example where kind of we developed those algorithms that uh, um, enable robotic systems to, for example, decide how to fly, and then we can apply it to uh, small systems, large systems, and very often we can apply it to completely other type of robotic systems. So uh, a very different type of uh, robots that we have uh, and that we work with are manipulated. So this is a what's uh, uh, known as a PR2 robot. PR2 was actually uh, built by, um, uh, as a, from a hardware perspective, was built by a company, Willow Garage, was, which was uh, actually in uh, California, in Bay Area. Uh, and uh, uh, my group uh, develops uh, a lot of manipulation uh, uh, planning algorithms for this uh, guy. So in this particular case, it works at a conveyor and it has to uh, decide how to pick up the objects, how to move its arms, and it has to do it fast because those objects are coming along the conveyor, so it has to react fast, otherwise it will miss it. Um, the same type of algorithms uh, for the motion planning, uh, for uh, planning for the arms, were used on uh, industrial manipulators, uh, which is this one, that's a KUKA arm. It's a very large, uh, um, uh, manipulator that sits on a mobile base, and this is uh, actually uh, F-16 uh, aircraft, uh, and uh, um, the manipulator um, strips the paint of those aircraft, and in order to be able to do that, it has to control its arm. Uh, so the same type of uh, uh, algorithms that we run on PR2, we run on this guy uh, to enable it to understand how it can move its arm so that it can position its uh, end effect, uh, like the thing at the end of the arm, uh, so that it can uh, move it along the uh, F-16 aircraft and strip the paint. Uh, here is a much more complex uh, example of planning where it's planning, uh, PR2 is planning how to build an object. Uh, and you'll see in a second what type of object it builds, but it has to move its arms. It also has to make a decision of how, which pieces to attach, how to attach them and so on and so on. It has a, um, nail gun in one of its uh, arms and it has a, a grip in the other one. It builds uh, um, the, uh, the, the birdhouses, um, as you can see here, uh, which is of course, uh, maybe it's not as relevant in uh, California, but here it gets cold in the winter. So it is actually quite relevant in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So anyway, um, uh, my group develop, uh, basically develops the algorithms that enable all kinds of different robotic systems to uh, make decisions about how to uh, move in the world, what to do, 
Um, and uh, the movement in the world goes anywhere from driving to flying uh, to manipulating things and so on and so on. That's what uh, my group does. Um, the uh, uh, talk that I actually wanted to give is about um, more uh, robotics as a whole, as opposed to specifically planning. Uh, and uh, in the next, uh, whatever, half an hour, 20 minutes or so, what I would like to go over is the overall robotics architecture uh, in a typical robot, uh, how it's structured, and then give a, a slight uh, um, kind of a overview of the math that goes behind each one of those blocks. So here is a typical robotics architecture um, that is employed in uh, most of the modern uh, kind of in the field robotic systems. There is a human operator that gives a high level command. Let's say there is a ground robot uh, or maybe there is an aerial vehicle or there is a manipulator, it doesn't matter. There is a human operator that gives high level commands, for example, for a ground vehicle to uh, go to a point A. Uh, once that high level command is given, there is a planning um, which um, decides what path uh, the robot should follow uh, to get there. Um, if we're talking about uh, something like a building, a manipulator building a, a birdhouse that you, that you saw, the high level command is uh, build me a birdhouse. Uh, and then uh, uh, the planning actually involves uh, not just uh, uh, how to move an arm, but also figuring out uh, the sequence of tasks that need to be done in order to accomplish this high level task. So, Planning uh, basically uh, combines both uh, reasoning about the sequence of actions as well as a low level motion planning, which is just figuring out the trajectory that the robot needs to uh, take. Um, once uh, we have that trajectory or another way to uh, call it a path, that path goes out to a controller. This low level controller is something that sits down uh, on uh, kind of a, uh, very close to the hardware of the robot and uh, it uh, controls the uh, wheels, if it's, we're talking about a ground vehicle, uh, that uh, to, to make sure that, that the robot follows the path that it was planned. Um, now, uh, so it's basically in a full control of the actual wheels. Uh, the way it does that is that uh, besides having a path, it also has to know where the robot is at at any point of time which is typically, it's called the localization module. That's the thing that sits on the robot and at any point of time decides where the robot is in the world so that it can try to figure out uh, what it should do in, in order to follow the path. At the same time, uh, of course, as it uh, traverses the world, it's going to see more and more obstacles. It will discover that uh, there are obstacles on the way and so on. All that information has to go into planning. In order to be able to perceive those obstacles, we have to have a, what's called a perception module. That perception module uh, analyzes the data from the sensors, like laser sensors and so on, uh, and uh, uses that to build the map. So that's the overall robotics architecture. Uh, and um, here is an example of that robotics architecture running on a ground vehicle. That's another one of those uh, robots that uh, my group worked on. This is actually an urban challenge vehicle. Uh, that um, uh, won the race, Urban Challenge race in 2007. So this was kind of was a, um, the big race that organized by DARPA that was uh, effectively the precursor to all that stuff that happened on, uh, for self-driving vehicles. So in red is the path that's being generated by the planner. Uh, yeah, of course, as the vehicle traverses, it needs to know where it is and uh, the controller, which is kind of those colorful things, that always directs the robot so that it can follow that path. Now the perception is uh, something that runs on this vehicle and in uh, real time it observes where all the obstacles are and it builds this map. So that's why you see a bunch of those obstacles are a little bit flickering, that's because uh, uh, there is always noise in perception and as it uh, up, kind of detects new obstacles, it will add them to the map. So, and then uh, given all that, uh, it uh, has to, uh, the controller has to follow this path in order to be able to, um, uh, to get to where it wants to go. Um, so, 
the of course uh, kind of this is a typical architecture and uh, the uh, uh, the kind of a, the, the important part of the, the gist of it is what type of math goes into every single one of those uh, pieces within that architecture um, so in the next uh, 15 minutes or so what i would like to do is to uh, try to explain how each one of those three uh, blocks uh, in the architecture work, in particular the control, the perception, and localization. Uh, and uh, there is some of the basic math concepts that uh, each one of those uh, blocks uh, rely on. Uh, and I would like to kind of go over uh, and give you an intuitive idea uh, for uh, how those blocks operate. Now, of course, uh, you know, there might be a question, uh, what is the motivation for doing that? And uh, frankly speaking, uh, the, uh, the motivation for me is uh, to do that is because uh, I strongly believe that in order for uh, folks to uh, actually um, better learn mathematics, uh, it's very important to be able to see examples of that math as being utilized. and. Uh, I think robotics is an exciting area where it's very interdisciplinary uh, and uh, there's lots and lots of very cool examples that are being uh, uh, posted on the internet uh, all the time uh, and a lot of people get excited about it. But uh, in reality, uh, it utilizes a lot of uh, simple math concepts in a variety of different uh, parts of this robotics. And uh, um, my hope is that by uh, uh, showing how those uh, math concepts that are being uh, learned and taught in high school, uh, how those concepts uh, are being utilized in robotics, you folks can actually get a better understanding of uh, the mathematics. You can get uh, much more motivated uh, for why those concepts are important and also get uh, much more excited about uh, the uh, robotics as an area. So that's just kind of the motivation for um, why <clears throat> Uh, this is something that uh, um, I think is uh, you know, worthwhile to do. Um, to that end, uh, kind of motivated by this, uh, uh, we actually created uh, what we call uh, the Robot Doctor series. Those are TV series that were broadcasted across Pennsylvania. It was a collaboration with the uh, PBS the TV station. Uh, and those are about uh, kind of eight episodes uh, about the robotics. Uh, explaining a uh, number of different problems in robotics, uh, like localization, controls, uh, and uh, perception, and so on, and uh, trying to explain them using purely the high school math. Uh, and uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I will give uh, some uh, excerpts, uh, some pieces from that the robot doctor, which are uh, trying to give you an idea about each one of those blocks. And uh, my hope uh, is that uh, uh, this is something that will give you a high-level uh, overview of uh, uh, robotics, uh, but at the same time, uh, more importantly, uh, tell you where the pieces of math that you learn in math is actually uh, how it can be utilized in, within robotics. Okay, I see. So it's not as much about the uh, robotics uh, itself, but it's more about the uh, use of math. Professor, uh, just to go back a little bit, um, for the video you showed regarding the, uh, the vehicle that was moving, was that route pre-made or was it, or did it come up with that route um, using sensors uh, as it was driving? Oh yeah, of course, yeah. So, so it's, uh, um, in fact, in, in, in all of those videos, but in particular in that one, uh, it's uh, uh, runs a planner online. Uh, so in that particular case, it was running at that 10 hertz where uh, at every 100 milliseconds, you are regenerating the path uh, in response to the obstacles uh, that you're seeing. So, and this is why uh, that uh, architecture is the way it's done, uh, that planning is uh, always run in a closed loop. So you're constantly seeing the new information and then you're replanning. So that was the case there. Does that answer okay. your question? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? No? Um, so, first, uh, let me kind of uh, um, focus on the localization module. So, as I said before, in the localization module, the, um, the task of that module is uh, for the robot to understand where it is in the world. 
Um, so, and in order for me to go through that, uh, let me actually play a short segment uh, out of the robot doctor, which will specifically talk about the localization and how uh, you can uh, kind of uh, uh, understand that using purely the, uh, the math, high school math that you folks are supposed to be um, uh, something that you covered. And particularly, it's a lot about the equations of circles. Uh, by the way, in terms of time, uh, I just want to make sure that I'm clear. So it's, what uh, type of uh, time deadline are we talking about? Like, when is the end of uh, my talk? Um, at around 3.15. Okay, cool. Very good. So let me play that. Hopefully, it actually will play fine. Let me know if it's uh, laggy at any point of time. This is actually one of the robots from my lab. Consider the tree, we have the equation x minus 2 quantity squared plus y minus 13 quantity squared equals 10 squared. As we said earlier, if we only look at one object, then we could be anywhere on the circle. So let's add one of the other objects to help narrow down the possibilities. 
In our example map, we will use the bush as our second object. It is at 13, 11. We know we are five meters from the bush. We can use the equation of the circle, that's x minus a quantity squared plus y minus b quantity squared equals r squared with the location of the bush to get the new equation x minus 13 quantity squared plus y minus 11 quantity squared equals 5 squared. Now we have two equations, one for the tree and one for the bush. We also have two unknowns, x and y. Let's expand the tree equation and simplify. So you get an idea. So you basically have uh, um, the several equations. Uh, so in particularly from two um, landmarks, uh, you can actually construct two equations that will give you up to two points of intersections, of course, because the two circles, they can uh, uh, intersect at two points. And this is where you need the third circle. So you need a third landmark. So if you have a third landmark, that will allow you to disambiguate it. Uh, where exactly you're at. Uh, and that will give you the precise location where the rubber is at. So if you have uh, uh, three uh, landmarks, so basically if you, somebody gives you a map uh, where they indicated there is a building here, there's another building over there, and then there is another, I don't know, uh, a mailbox over here. And if the robot is able to detect those three things, then using those three things, uh, using the distances to them, it can uh, construct those circles, compute the intersection between all of them, and that gives you exactly the location of where the robot is in the wall. Now, of course, um, the uh, uh, self-driving vehicles, uh, for example, they often rely on GPS, uh, and GPS gets this data from satellites, and the idea is exactly the same. If you have uh, three satellites, then you can get a distances from it, and then you can construct the similar type of uh, circles to figure out where you're in the wall. Now, there is a little bit uh, additional to, to that because when you're relying on a satellite, because uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, um, Earth itself is not a plane, but it rather it's a, a spherical, uh, um, you actually need the fourth satellite. And with four satellites, you can construct uh, uh, the four uh, equations for the circle, and that will give you exactly uh, the position of the vehicle. So are there times when the robot has to, has to depend on only two reference points or even one reference point? Yeah, absolutely, right. So of course this uh, does rely, like those uh, equations that uh, John uh, shown here, relies on three landmarks. Uh, there could be a scenario where you only see one landmark. And if you think about it, that means that you're in somewhere on the circle. Now, um, the typically in robotics, uh, what you want to also do is propagate over time uh, the information about where the robot is at. So if you knew before that uh, you were at that location uh, and you were moving, then you can uh, predict uh, kind of uh, where the robot should be uh, approximately. And then when you get information um, from a landmark, so you see a, a landmark, so that means that you know that you should be on that circle then you can take intersection of that circle with your prediction and that will tell you approximately where it's at. Uh, if you have two landmarks that you see, then it already immediately gives you that it's an intersection between uh, those two circles and there are only two places where you can be. Then uh, whatever the prediction you used to have, uh, you can uh, uh, use that to disambiguate, decide where you should be. So uh, sure. you don't have to, and in fact, the, most of the time you don't actually have access to all three landmarks. Uh, but the idea is very much of that. So does that make sense? Yes. All right. So that's that. Uh, that's localization. That's kind of a, uh, kind of a, uh, the uh, one on one on uh, some of the basics of uh, localization. Um, the perception. Uh, Robert needs to understand: uh, Is that an obstacle in front of me? Where is that obstacle in front of me? Uh, so there is obvious a question of how do we. Um, uh, how does a robot maintain information about the obstacles in the world? Uh, and how does it detect uh, those obstacles? So I will, uh, towards that, I will play in uh, kind of a different segment. 
which stands for light detection and radio. Light is super useful in robotics. It's similar to the radar, which uses radio waves. So with LIDAR, the sensor will send out a pulse of light and measure the time it takes to get a reflection back in order to calculate the distance of the object. Let's look closer at how LIDAR works. The most common type of LIDAR for robots is the scanning or rotating LIDAR. This type of LIDAR spins around at high speed, allowing it to rapidly get measurements in many different directions. This is a, what's called a Velodyne LIDAR, uh, very popular in the self-driving community. Uber, Argo, yeah, and a number of other companies, they all use a Velodyne LIDAR, which is effectively a spinning mirror that sends out those, uh, um, uh, those uh, uh, rays. If our LIDAR system produces four pulses per revolution, it may tell us that there is an object five meters in front of us, four meters to the left, three meters behind us, and 10 meters to the right. However, most scanning LIDARs have many more than four pulses per revolution. A common low-cost LIDAR has more than 1,000 pulses per revolution. This results in a high resolution, which can allow scanning LIDARs to map the surfaces of complex objects and perform highly accurate surveys of such things as houses and other buildings. What the LIDAR produces for the robot is a list of directions called relative bearings and an accompanying distance in each of those directions. They are called relative bearings because they measure the angle between the robot and the object, rather than from some absolute reference such as the x-axis. We'll use the Greek letter phi to refer to the relative bearings for the LIDAR. The data from a scanning LIDAR is essentially points and polar coordinates. If you remember polar coordinates, they consist of an angle and a range, exactly the same as the range and relative bearing the LIDAR produces. As the robot moves around your house, it collects lots of measurements in this form, all different types of objects. But what does the robot do with this data? It could try to use it directly stopping motion if the sensor detects an object in front of the robot within some minimum range. But that approach is better as a safety system, rather than a reliable method for long-term navigation. We need a way of storing the information the robot gets from each scan. The easiest method is to simply store a grid. Imagine we make a grid of 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter cells. In our case, let's assume we had an object 5.4 meters away, at a position of 6.1 and 7.9. We would mark the cell corresponding to the range 6 to 6.5 on X and 7.5 and 8 on Y as having an obstacle. That can work, but it only really works well for things like walls that don't ever move. Once I mark a cell as having an obstacle, there really isn't a method to remove the obstacle. Well, let's think back to how we got that data point from the robot. We did get a light reflection from something at 5.4 meters away from us, but it tells us something more. It tells us that we did not get a return from anything between 0 and 5.4 meters away as well. It tells us that the light went all the way to 5.4 meters without hitting anything. So not only can we fill in the cell at the end of our laser strip, we can clear out any cell between here and there as well. So LIDAR is, uh, at least uh, from my, in my mind, one of the uh, greatest um, uh, developments in the robotics. Uh, uh, it, before LIDAR uh, were invented uh, and utilized in robotics, uh, um, sonars uh, and a lot of uh, those type of sensors were used for detecting obstacles and they're quite noisy. Uh, and also don't allow you to build very accurate maps. Um, and uh, from that uh, kind of due to this, uh, uh, robotic systems were quite uh, um, brittle and incapable of uh, navigating, particularly indoors. Uh, the LiDAR uh, really made a huge change. Uh, it allows uh, robots to construct much, much uh, more precise maps. It allows them to uh, build those maps and then uh, put these uh, landmarks on the map so that you can once again localize against them. 
Um, and it also allows uh, for self-driving vehicles outdoors to detect uh, other vehicles uh, well, to detect pedestrians well, and so on. Of course, so there are uh, still uh, a lot of uh, uh, unsolved problems there and so on, but uh, it was uh, one of the huge advances. Um, so um, anyway, so, so using the LIDARs, it can detect uh, uh, objects in the world. It can detect, put them in as obstacles into this um, uh, map that it constructs. Uh, and uh, it can also uh, clear uh, the uh, cells. So whenever the LIDAR goes in and uh, uh, if it passes through a particular cell, that means that that cell is free. Now, of course, there is some amount of noise uh, associated with that. And therefore, quite often, uh, it's being uh, um, done statistically. So you actually count how many uh, hits you get from a particular cell. And then uh, uh, with every single cell, you associate the probability that there is an ob uh, object in there. And you can do it just like that by counting, or you can apply a, uh, what's called the base uh, um, uh, the theory to do the base updates uh, and uh, um, build the map in kind of a more a rigorous fashion. One way or another, it comes down to this uh, grid map that is being built, uh, and that's the map that is being used uh, for path planning. So figuring out how you're going to get from point A to point B around the objects and around the obstacles that you have detected so far. Does that make sense? Are there any questions on that? Yeah, so um, you had mentioned that there is some sort of probability involved. So for the likelihood of something actually being at a certain cell, so how does it make a decision? Like, is there certain cutoff values? Like, if there's a 90% chance that there's something there, it's going to make the decision. Is that kind yeah, of how so, it makes it? Right. So, so you can uh, certainly do the cutoffs, and those typically um, cutoffs uh, would not be something like 0 0.5, but you would do them much more uh, conservatively. So, in other words, if uh, there is a, uh, even a chance of 0 0.2 or something along that line that there is an obstacle, you don't want to go in there. Okay. Um, the other thing is that uh, when you do do path planning on it, so when you're trying to figure out a path uh, through this grid to your goal, um, you, as much as possible, you would like to prefer the cells that are known to be free. Uh, and uh, there are still could be a lot of cells that uh, uh, are unknown uh, to you in a sense that you have not seen, uh, uh, the LIDAR has not seen them. Uh, so there is some sort of an initial prior uh, probability associated with them being free uh, or um, uh, obstacle. And then the, uh, you cannot, of course, assume that they're obstacle because otherwise you might not be able to get to a goal, but you can uh, assign a higher cost to them so that as much as possible, you prefer to avoid them unless that's the only way how you're going to get to the goal. And then you still plan through it. And the idea is that as you go through it, the sensor will uh, detect and will give you information whether there is or there isn't an obstacle on that. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so does anyone else have questions regarding this? Uh, so I just have a question that's um, kind of like a follow-up to this. So, um, so first of all, uh, so uh, as you highlighted, uh, robotics is built on these mathematical pr principles that are taught in high school. So um, I'm curious and I'd like to hear your thoughts on how we can enable high schoolers to get hands-on exposure in applying math in robotics. Um, so, so, I mean, uh, the, the uh, um, I'm kind of, a, that this is a more high level philosophical question. I think, uh, uh, the, uh, there is obviously a lot of efforts uh, going on in uh, bringing robotics to the high school and having the robotic platforms uh, that are uh, low cost and can be utilized for all kinds of different things, competitions and so on and so on. Um, I think that uh, um, those efforts uh, are quite a lot um, isolated from uh, mathematics that's being taught. So it's like, you know, there is a Right over there, there is a classroom of mathematics, and that typically has nothing to do with the classroom on computer science or robotics. Uh, whereas, uh, um, I think looking at it more holistically and understanding that the math that we see here, you know, like the use of pole coordinate systems uh, to uh, get the readings from a laser 
using the equations of circles uh, to get a localization. This is exactly the math that is being taught over there. And that uh, robotics is an excellent uh, pathway how you can take that and translate it into the programming, into the computer science uh, that is, uh, uh, can utilize this math to build um, software for robotics. So, you know, you take your, um, I don't know, whatever the Lego robots and some cheap uh, robotic platform, uh, you put uh, uh, pretty cheap uh, sensors on top of them, and then uh, you can build um, simple algorithms uh, that allow the robots to localize, allow the robot to build the maps using that math that's being taught. And it's really kind of uh, looking at this holistically, combining the mathematics and computer science together. Uh, I think from my perspective, that's a very effective way to learn both mathematics and computer science. And we currently uh, have uh, several schools in Pennsylvania here who are uh, kind of trying to uh, pilot uh, that type of approach. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So for the sake of time, I will not talk about the controller. Uh, there is also kind of a similar type of uh, way how you can uh, uh, take the operation of a controller and uh, decompose it into the um, simple math that uh, you can use uh, to, to understand its operation. It's actually a lot about vector algebra. So, so you know, um, something that uh, uh, relies on uh, the uh, dot product uh, uh, and so on, uh, but I will not, I will skip that for the sake of time. Um, the planning uh, portion is actually the only one uh, that, uh, uh, frankly speaking, is a pure uh, computer science. So funny enough, that's the one that I, uh, I actually, my group works in, uh, but it is uh, much more computer science than math. So in, in, in a high level, you know, once you have that grid that you show, you saw um, that was built by a robot, you can construct what's called a graph uh, and you can search that graph uh, for a path uh, for solution, uh, you know, for a path uh, from the start to the goal, from the current location of the robot to its goal. Um, and uh, the same principle can be applied uh, to doing planning for much, much more complex systems for like self-driving vehicles, you know, the type of uh, um, planning that they do is very often uh, to construct a specialized graphs uh, that uh, model the roads on which uh, they do planning um, for aerial vehicles um, and so on. It's, it's, uh, and even for manipulators, uh, it's uh, also uh, some variants of uh, graphs that they have to construct in order to do planning. So, um, but for the sake of time, I will skip that and also will just say that that's a uh, black that is actually much more computer science than uh, uh, math. So um, yeah, I will uh, stop uh, at that and uh, conclude with uh, kind of a, uh, just uh, my, uh, uh, once again, uh, reiteration of some of uh, my thoughts, in particular that I think uh, robotics is a very exciting interdisciplinary field which has uh, lots and lots of uh, cool demos. Um, and um, you know, uh, everybody likes to see those uh, cool robots uh, doing uh, cool stuff. Uh, it is uh, pretty heavy on mathematics and computer science, but uh, um, I think uh, I personally like uh, simplicity and everything as much as possible. And uh, from my perspective, I think a lot of uh, uh, robotic compo components can and should be decomposed into much simpler mathematical con CS concepts and uh, uh, should be utilized those uh, um, to, to make it accessible and um, to, to, to kind of un, you know, have the folks understand how the math that they uh, learn in uh, high school can actually be utilized in the systems. Uh, the robot doctor that I played a few uh, samples from, uh, uh, they, uh, it, it tries uh, to do that um, and we're in the process of uh, kind of uh, in integrating it into the uh, some of the high school uh, curricula in uh, Pennsylvania. So uh, we'll see how that works. But anyway, if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, and I would be more than happy to chat about it. Uh, are there any other questions? No one else has any questions. Uh, I think we can conclude that. Uh, thank you so much for coming and speaking. Um, it was very uh, insightful talk and um, I'm sure everyone's able to take uh, something away from it. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man.